So, hello. My name is Andrei Sitnik. Thank you for great introduction. Uh, uh, I am from Russia, St. Petersburg. Winter is coming. It's totally about my country. Um, I am working on uh, Evil Martians team. Unfortunately, right now we have no blasters and robots, only Ruby on Rails and React. But we are working, we are working on eBay Social Group on Russia, and my current project is Amplifier, Social Media Tool. But I think you may know me better for my open source as author of After Prefixer and Post CSS. So today we will talk about uh, CSS processing, of course, because it's CSS conf. Um, so, how many people here use uh, less SAS stylus? Oh, <laughs> after prefixer? Uh, who is after prefixer? Just, just real? Okay. Uh, if you have used after prefixer, you may saw that it um, it works. It works not like Compass, Bourbon, or any other mixing libraries. It has no mixings at all. In after prefixer, you just wrote properties, selectors, and just with the magic, it became a prefixed CSS. Uh, this has happened because after prefixer is not a, not a preprocessor. After prefixer is um, just a plugin for post CSS, a new way to process CSS, a new tool to extend or even replace preprocessors. So, what is post CSS? We will start from theory. What is the idea behind post-CSS? An idea is evolution. I really, I really believe in evolution. I, be, I believe that uh, every long-time developing process is based on evolution. We have a great example of uh, evolution right here, the results of the biological evolution. But also we use uh, artificial evolution in our computer science, and Richard Dawkins even suggested that uh, Human ideas, human culture is also a result of the uh, same evolution process. So what is the evolution? These three, three steps is inside every evolution process. So every evolution process is based on random mutation, natural selection in the wild, and inheritance. And my main question is, do we have these steps in our web? Do we develop a W3C specification by these steps? And I think no. Of course, we have a lot of inheritance. We have a lot of old specification, legacy code, like stuff we don't want to support. But do we have a natural selection in our web? The Blink tag is a good example. Um, think about it. Is it uh, do we have a way to dismiss some specification with some problems? For example, we create some specification without a very big problem. Can we dismiss specification if many sites become to use this specification? I think no. Even BlinTech was never be a part of any specification. It was just a vendor-specific tech for Netscape only. It was supported only by Mozilla, uh, Netscape, and Opera. But in this case, in this very good case, Mozilla was forced to support it for 19 years. And this problem, the problem that we can dismiss specifications, this problem creates other problems. Uh, will you try some interesting but crazy idea if you understand that you must to support your mistakes for years? Because we have a lot of very strange, very nice ideas, but can we use it in W3C? Because we have no way to dismiss specification. And it is why random mutation is very important part of any evolution. This is why freedom is so important. Because there is no way to find a um, great idea without mistakes. Every great idea looks like very crazy at the beginning. Remember what people thought about iPhone when it was released? Remember what people thought about JavaScript development just five or seven years ago? So development is about making mistakes. And this is why uh, we need some playground. And this is why preprocessors is so big deal. Preprocessors are playground when we can, where we can test some ideas before it became a standard. Um, of course, CoffeeScript is a good example. How many people here hate CoffeeScript? 
of course, we hate it because it's not so cool. It's very strange, especially if you don't use Python. But without CoffeeScript, we will have no such great ES6 standard because 30% of the ideas was uh, of the ideas in ES6 was tested in CoffeeScript. Even new ideas in uh, ES7 was uh, also tested in ICID CoffeeScript. And so I'm very proud for JavaScript preprocessors because it is still a good playground. For example, we have uh, Yelm. It is a preprocessor for JavaScript that will compile to JavaScript with time travel debugger. It's a really crazy but awesome idea. I think it will change uh, the way how we develop JavaScript. But um, do pre CSS preprocessors are still that, this, this playground? Do we have some new ideas in preprocessors? I think no. I think preprocessors are in the middle of stagnation. And I'll show you why. First, what is the preprocessors, CSS preprocessors? CSS preprocessor is like a template language, like a PHP, when you mix your code with your styles. The first question is, do we really, uh, is it a really great idea to mix your code and styles? But OK, let it be. Uh, but in P PHP, we can put our code is in any place. But in CSS preprocessor and SAS less, there is only a few places to put our magic. For example, uh, Bourbon or Compass or any other mixing libraries can define only variables, mixings, and, or functions. But what about the units? There is a very nice unit, RAM. It is a new unit. It is uh, supported not by the all browsers, but it's very easy to polyfill it. So c can we create a polyfill with uh, preprocessors? It is very difficult. It's not so easy because we have no units in uh, preprocessors. And the first problem is because of the second one. It is very difficult to change something inside CSS preprocessors because they have a lot of code, they have a lot of files, a lot of line of codes, and SAS team go further. They rewrote project to C++. How many people here know C++? So we have a less developers to change something inside uh, preprocessors. And last but not least problem of preprocessors. I'm not big a fan of JavaScript because I am previous uh, Ruby developer. But let's be clear. SAS programming languages is even worse. Can you read this? I think no, me neither. But it's not some, some important, some big stuff. It is just a transition, transition mixing in Compass. We need so many lines for just a transition Mixins. And this is why we have a post CSS right now to fix all the problems. But post CSS was not the first. The original idea was by TJ Halavachuk. He wrote, I, I think, about the half of NPM packages. And it was a stylus developer three years ago, stylus maintainer. And he understood that uh, preprocessor, preprocessors have a big problems inside. And there is no way to fix it because the preprocessor's uh, problems are inside a uh, architecture. So he created a new way to process CSS. He created a modular CSS processor tools rework. And first, ver first version of uh, after prefixer was based on rework. But uh, too quickly, after, after prefixer became too big for rework. So we create a post-CSS because rework was um, just proof of concept, just uh, first, first generation of modular CSS processing. With post-CSS, we have a better parser, better API, better source map support. So what is post-CSS? How post-CSS works? Post-CSS core is very small. Post-CSS core contains only two parts, parser, which parses uh, your CSS string to uh, CSS nodes three, three of the objects, uh, abstract syntax three, abstract syntax three, and CSS stringifier, which receive, which receives uh, that uh, node three and uh, generate a new CSS string. So by default, post CSS do nothing. By default, post CSS parse your CSS and stringify it back to the CSS without any changes, byte to byte. 
because suppose CSS uh, stores all white spaces, all information about your CSS string. All magic, all CSS magic happens in plugins. Plugins, every plugin is just a simple JavaScript function that receives uh, Z node is three, and change something inside. It is just object tree, so pl uh, JavaScript function can travel through this tree, change something, find something, add some nodes, delete some nodes, and, and return uh, modified node is three. Then we send this, uh, this tree to the next plugin, to the next plugin, like a chain. And as result, in the, in the end, we will send this changes node is three to the stringifier. And Syngify will generate changes CSS string with the new source map. But let's look at the code, because code is only thing that is important. Post CSS is not is npm package, so we load it from npm. Next, we create a post CSS instance, and we set an array of the plugins. And that's all. Now we can process CSS string through this uh, uh, post CSS instance and uh, get our result in promise. Um, plugin, plugin code is more interesting. So, remember I told about uh, RAM unit polyfill. Let's write it in post-CSS. So, every post-CSS plugin is just a function that receives node 3. Uh, this node 3 is an uh, object with many uh, methods, so we can run Execute a methods, uh, execute a methods to iterate through all uh, declaration node. Declaration is a property column value. In every declaration node, we try to find RAM string inside the value and replace it by simple JavaScript. That's all. We need only four lines to create a RAM polyfill, which is impossible to do with the same API in preprocessors. So what is the difference between post-CSS and preprocessors like SAS, LESS, and Stylus? In preprocessors, you mix your code with your styles. It's mixed together. It's written by like a PHP. Uh, in post-CSS, all magic happen by JavaScript function. You split your, co your, your code base to the styles and to the JavaScript uh, magic. And the second difference is that all, all preprocessors features are inside the preprocessors. Preprocessors are monolithics too. And in post-CSS, post-CSS core do nothing. Post-CSS is total or modular tool. So why it's important, why it works? Because these um, modular architectures can bring us evolution back, can allow us to use evolution in our web development process. So how it works? You have some crazy idea. For example, new way to, uh, to create the size optimization tool. You create a plugin, just a JavaScript function. And of course, many people became to hate your plugin because hate is going to hate. <laughs> but emo emotions doesn't matter because if your plugin really works, if your plugin really does some interesting stuff, many and many developers will start to use it. And so your, your plugin became uh, popular, like after prefixer. And for, if your plugin become too popular, you can go to W3C and create specification. And you will have free time to write second plugin and go by this round again. So with post-CSS, with the plugins, we can have uh, evolution back in our web. We can use uh, evolution steps to develop new specification, new technologies to test some ideas before it became a specifications. But, but um, it was only theory. Our current science says that theory means nothing without really practical results. So if post-CSS really works, we will have some practical results. Are we? Of course, post-CSS has plugins for variables, for nesting, rules for mixings because it's really too simple. But the important thing that that plugins for variables, for mixing, for nesting are very small. For example, the post-CSS nested plugin is just uh, about uh, 60 lines of code. So it is very easy to fork it, to change something. If you disagree with me, with my API for nesting, 
You can fork this plugin and create your own without any problem. But PostCSS is not about doing uh, preprocessor stuff with modules. No. The main goal of PostCSS is to do some new stuff, to create some new task, to solve it, to change something amazing that was impossible on, post, on preprocessors. So I will show you some plugins that are totally impossible on SAS. The first example is after prefixer. After prefixer is impossible to do with preprocessors. How after prefixer works? After prefixer contains can I use database. You write some CSS, just simple CSS without mixings, just properties, selectors. Very simple. And after prefixer take your CSS, takes can I use database, takes browsers that I that you are support, and after prefixer automatically adds only necessary plugins, only, uh, only necessary prefixes, only prefixes this, that are really actual for your projects, for your browsers, for your CSS, by can use database. But I think everybody know about the prefixer, yes? Um, how many people here use uh, Babel, Tracer? No, it's CSS conference, yes? It's wrong place to ask. Uh, we have a new standard for JavaScript called ES6. It is a future standard. There is no browser with ES6 supports right now. So we have uh, some compilers. Babel and Tracer compilers, which compile our future CSS, uh, future JavaScript with ES6 features to our current ES5 JavaScripts. But it will be good to have something like this in CSS. It will be good to write CSS for right now don't wait until all browsers will support CSS4. Because CSS4 contains very amazing things. For example, CSS4 contains custom selectors. You can, in CSS4, you can define your own custom selector and use it. Or, for example, we have uh, new properties with uh, readable values. A lot of things in CSS4. And with post-CSS, you can use CSS4 right now. By CSS Next plugin, it was written by French developer Mox. So you add post-CSS, you add post-CSS plugins, and you can just write CSS4 and it will be compiled to CSS3. Next six things will be very scary. There is a Chinese, there is a, China has a very big IT market. It was, uh, there are a lot of money there. But unfortunately, there is a one really scary things in Chinese market. Chinese users still use Internet Explorer. Not just Internet Explorer 9 or 10, Chinese users use Internet Explorer 8, 7, sometimes even 6. And so it's very difficult to develop something for Chinese market. And this is why the Alibaba, it is one of the biggest IT company in China, wrote a CSS Grace plugin for post-CSS. It is like CSS Next, but in a different way. It takes your CSS 3. <laughs> and convert it to CSS2 with the uh, hacks for Internet Explorers. Next thing, I will read uh, article End of the Global CSS. It was posted by uh, on CSS Tricks on many sites. Uh, it is the idea to isolate your selectors by adding a uh, random and a totally unique uh, postfix. So we have uh, some JavaScript that will process your CSS and will 100% isolate your selectors. It's like a BAM, but it's more sure. It's, uh, it's uh, more useful when you create some widgets for different sites and you have no idea what selectors will be on different sites. So it is a good idea to convert them to some 100% uh, sure unique selectors. And you can do it with uh, post-CSS plugin CSS modules. Next things. Uh, we have about 5% of color, color, color blind users on our sites. I think for most of uh, uh, you, it's more than Internet Explorer users. So if you test your sites with Internet Explorer, you should definitely test it for uh, color blind users. And this is why Netflix wrote a plugin, PostCSS Colorblind. It takes your CSS and replaces all colors to emulate some color blindness. 
And we have a result. For example, you can see that uh, this button is uh, very, very good visible with, to the people who see all colors. But for some color blindness, it, is, it will be less visible. And next things. Uh, we can use post-CSS not only to transform our CSS, but also to lint it. For example, Twitter use post-CSS. They have a post-CSS BAM linter plugin to lint their BAM style. But post-CSS has uh, much smarter linters. For example, do I use? Do I use lint your CSS with can I use database? It, ca it can warn you that some properties uh, doesn't support it by your all of your browsers that you need to support. Or other good example is uh, post-CSS fix, uh, Flexbox fixes. There is a very good database, Flexboxes. It contains um, Flexbox browser issues. And so we have a uh, post-CSS Flexbox uh, fixes that will, limit, that will warn you if you have some uh, CSS that will that uh, doesn't work in all Flexbox browsers. But it is my favorite example. It is a Hebrew Wikipedia. You see that there's something different in it. Uh, in Hebrew language and in Arabic language, we wrote from right to the left. But our language, our writing system, has very great effect on our, our minds or our perspective. So in, for Hebrew and Arabic users, future is not on the right, it is on the left side. And so progress bars must go in from the right to the left. So we need to mirror all design of our sites like uh, Hebrew Wikipedia. But of course, it's very difficult to support two different versions of the CSS. And so Muhammad from Jordan wrote a RTL CSS plugin. This plugin will automatically mirror your site for Hebrew and Arabic users. It was used, for example, by WordPress to create uh, styles for uh, Arabic and Hebrew users of WordPress. It, it works simple. It replaces left to right, right to left, change order of the margins uh, arguments. But I show you only plugins, plugins that are totally impossible on SAS. But we have uh, much more plugins. We have more than uh, 100 plugins with, uh, some, with nice shortcuts, with language, language extension. Please open our GitHub page and check our all plugins list. But it, uh, now we has, uh, have a very difficult question. I show you that post-CSS is uh, much smarter than SAS. Post-CSS can do much more than SAS. But is it can be faster? Because it is very difficult to have a faster tool that can do more things, especially when you have Ellipsas written on C++. Can we compare with performance with Ellipsas? And answer is yes. PostCSS written on JavaScript is three times faster than Ellipsas. It is, happens not because JavaScript is some good language, not. It is only because uh, <laughs> it is a great example of, mod of benefits of modularity. When we have a small plugins, when we have, when we have a modular architectures, it is very easy to find uh, some slowest part of our project. It is very easy to optimize it. Because you can just uh, test your plugins one by one and find the slowest one. This is why PostCSS is faster. It is benchmark. You can. Uh, read the code on this link. Uh, we have a bootstrap uh, CSS with 100 mixings, with 100 variables, with 100 nesting rules. And this is the result of uh, processing this CSS. So what is uh, the benefits of post-CSS? Why post-CSS really works? What is the really result of post-CSS? Of course, we have a modular, modular design and performance. But it's not really important. The main idea of post-CSS, the main benefits of post-CSS is that post-CSS can do much more. With post-CSS, you will have completely different uh, development process because we open completely new tasks for you. But I lie to you. The topic title is uh, that post-CSS is the future, but post-CSS is the present. 
we have more than one uh, half million downloads uh, per month from NPM by NPM statistics. We have many great users. For example, Paul Irish told me that uh, Google use PostCSS with uh, after prefixer. Uh, WordPress use uh, after prefixer and uh, RTL CSS plugins. Taobao, it is the biggest China e-commerce. Uh, they use not they not just use PostCSS, they write uh, many new plugins. And my favorite example is the Twitter. Twitter has no preprocessors at all. Twitter use only post processors. They use rework right now, yeah, and they are in the middle of uh, migration to post CSS. And post CSS became a trend. For example, I read a part wrote a nice article how post CSS will save us from dark side of uh, preprocessors. Ben Freyd, uh, the author of uh, SAS for Designers, wrote a good art article about uh, his migration to post CSS. And uh, Bootstrap team now has plans to migrate to post CSS. So, what you need to do at this weekend? First, if you have some idea, if you have some idea of CSS tool, you need to think about written it in post CSS. For example, author of the lost grid system, he has a lot of plug a lot of uh, grid realization for SAS, for less, for stylus. He migrated to post CSS and he was very happy because uh, in if you write a mixing library, you need to write mixing library separated to SAS, separated to less users, separated to stylus users. But if you write a post CSS tool, it will be, uh, you can use it with any preprocessors, like a, after prefix, you just put it after the preprocessor compilation step. If you have a project without any post CSS plugins, you must go to home and add after prefix plugin. There is a many reason why you need to use after prefixer, but uh, I think the main reason is that uh, Google recommends only after prefixer as a tool to handle your prefixes. It's a really only good way to work with uh, prefixes right now. If you have a project already with some post CSS plugins like after prefixer, you need, uh, I think you should uh, look at other post CSS plugins because we have a really crazy ideas, we have all really nice solutions. I, I think CSS Next is a good uh, plugin to start. And if you start new projects, and only if you start a new project, try to think about post CSS only solution, because Twitter has it, they are very happy. Not because post CSS is, uh, not because uh, preprocessors are bad, preprocessors -process, pre are good things, but our IT, it's not about uh, code. Our IT is about keeping things simple. It's about simplicity. And one tool is always simpler than two tools. So if you start a new project, PostCSS can handle with nesting, mixing, and simple variables too. Think about use PostCSS only solution. And that's all. This is our URL, our projects on GitHub. This is a URL for this keynotes, Twitter for post CSS, please follow. That's all. <laughs> Do we have time to questions? No, nope. okay.